This video will talk about logistic regression. Logistic regression works well when we have binomial data. So a binomial count consists of something like a number of yes occurrences and a number of no occurrences. Think about it as something like a plant or an animal survived over time or it did not, or uh, some other category that we might assign to a variable of interest. And so we've looked at the binomial distribution a lot in class, and we knew that we needed n and p. We need to know how many observations we have, and we need to know the probability of some outcome, say the probability that a plant survives over some time period. What we were interested in is that proportion to say of all the plants that survived. So maybe call it yi over ni. So the expected value then is just that the proportion, what we'll denote p sub i, and the variance is 1 over n times p times 1 minus p. And so that's nothing new. We've looked at the binomial distribution in class up to this point. Same thing for the variance. Uh, we know the variance, then we can replace uh, mu sub i with y sub i over n sub i to represent uh, our population that we're interested in. And then the link function then is going to be, remember we call this a logit function, if we were to code this in R. And so it's going to represent some function, we'll call it g of u. That's going to be the logit function of, uh, of uh, sorry, mu, mu sub i, which we can represent by the log. If we take the logarithm of mu sub i divided by 1 minus mu sub i. And so this is how we might represent the logistic regression in a binomial format. So logistic regression in a nutshell analyzes a set of data in which there are one or more independent variables that determine an outcome. So this differs greatly from linear regression. In logistic regression, the dependent variable is categorical. Now for most of logistic regression problems, we only have two categories and we have binary data. We have a plant that survived or died, as an example. But we could have more than two categories. And if we had more than two, we'd call that multinomial logistic regression. We could have uh, more than uh, two, but they could also be ordered. And so in that case, we would have an ordinal logistic regression. You can think about this as like survey data. Uh, well, how many of you have answered a survey where you said, I'm likely to do something somewhat likely, somewhat unlikely, or unlikely. Um, and so the ranking or the order of those different categories matters. And so you might think about an ordinal logistic regression. And so again, we will use this logit link function uh, to perform a logistic regression analysis. So what's an example? In this example, we're looking at the probability of tree survival, and this is for ponderosa pine. And so what they've done, these researchers, have taken tree measurements, and they measured whether or not trees survived or died following a five-year period in the western United States. And so what happened was that the trees were measured at time one, and then they measured them five years later at time two. And so there's a link to this paper uh, in the notes. But in general, they use logistic regression to try to predict the survival of these ponderosa pine trees. And these were trees that were undergoing a mountain pine beetle outbreak, a pretty devastating uh, insect that's devastating a lot of pine trees in the western United States. And so what they found is that they used the diameter at breast height of a tree as a predictor of whether or not it could survive. And so what you're seeing on the y-axis is the probability of surviving those five-year periods. And so what they found was that larger trees have a higher probability of surviving than smaller sized trees. And so in this case, if you are a 20 centimeter tree, you have about a 40% chance of surviving. Whereas if you're an 80 centimeter tree, you have closer to a 90% chance of surviving. And so this is a great application and a great example of the logistic regression. In that same paper, they looked at looking at the probability of survival with a survival graph, uh, which you can see here. 
So this graph will forecast the survival of these pine trees through 50 years. And so what you can see is they've done uh, two examples with a tree with a DBH of 20 and then a tree with a DBH of 5. And they looked at the survival probability for that tree through time. And so you can see they all start out, they're all alive to start out with. After the first five year period, the larger diameter tree has a much greater chance of surviving than the smaller tree. And you can see those uh, differences are kind of magnified at longer time periods, up to 50 years. So if you're a five centimeter tree, you've got a really small chance of surviving, about maybe 10%. Whereas if you're a 20 centimeter tree, you've got about a 60% chance of surviving. And so this is really one of the great things about logistic regression is that it allows you to make really great graphs like this that show how um, how your data uh, might might look like through time. I want to talk about another example uh, where I've been a part of a study, uh, and these are some plots at the Cloquet Forestry Center that's asking the question, how do we grow northern red oaks to keep them free of deer? Um, and so northern red oak is a very important ecologically and economically tree species uh, in the lake states. It provides a lot of acorns that uh, wildlife like to use. Now the problem that foresters and other natural resource managers face is that deer like to browse young seedlings of northern red oaks. And so the challenge here is to come up with ways to grow northern red oaks to get them free of deer browse. And so typically we think of a deer uh, that can browse up to about eight feet in uh, a tree up to about eight feet tall. And so the idea here was how do we design a study to get these oak trees taller than eight feet so that they can get out of deer browse and into the canopy and start growing into be healthy, vigorous trees. And so to do this, a study was initiated. Uh, we call these the Trupp plots. Uh, and so this was a German idea, uh, this uh, Trupp Flansens, any of you that may know German. Uh, the idea here is to plant trees in tight clusters. And so in this case, we're planting 20 to 30 trees within a one meter square space to see uh, if they might be able to survive. And the idea is that if you plant so many in a tight cluster, very, very dense, one of those trees might survive and thrive, well, maybe the other ones might be browsed. And so it's kind of uh, trying to use an approach where you plant a lot and hope that you get at least one of them to survive. And so you can see the, uh, the different treatments here. What happened was that um, many of the plots of the trees were planted and they were unprotected. That is to say, they were not fenced in. Uh, and so the idea that a deer could just go up to a tree and, and browse it. But there are also ones that are protected. And so here we put a fence around all of the trees and trying to think that, uh, well, if we put a fence around it, the deer are gonna stay away. And so that might be something that foresters might do. And so you can see we have uh, three replicates of the unprotected area. And then we have three replicates of the protected area or the fenced areas. And so what we did was we collected height measurements in 2007, 2008, and 2013. And we have a record. We've been revisiting each tree to find out how they might have survived, uh, whether or not they've been browsed, and what their height might be through time. And so the idea here is that we are going to mod we are going to model using R the logistic regression equation of this. And so my predictor variable is is my tree outside of browse. That is to say, is it larger than eight feet tall? It's either a yes or a no by 2013. And so the last year we measured these, we were going to calculate uh, whether or not by 2013 it reached eight feet tall or more. And if it did, we said, great, uh, that means that tree can grow up and be healthy and it's outside of deer brows. If it didn't, well, we have suspicion to believe that that tree might be more susceptible to brows. And so the two independent variables that we used were the tree's diameter the last time we measured it, its diameter in 2008, and then the treatment. Again, that treatment being, was it protected or unprotected? 
And then this is a regression model. So we're going to say family is binomial. The link is logit. And then my data set name here is trup. And so here's the R output. You can see it calls back the data with the GLM form. It gives me the residuals. It gives me the coefficients. Remember the estimates, the standard error, the values for the Z, and then the probability that they're greater than some value for that Z. And you can see it gives me uh, significant codes. It gives me measures of deviance. And importantly, it gives me the measure of the AIC. And so if I wanted to then make a new model and compare, I could look at this value of AIC. Now, the important thing is that what is it saying about the impacts of fencing, as an example? Well, here it's, it's got a negative coefficient for the no fencing treatment. And so this would indicate that if it was fenced, we would have a higher probability of getting outside of browse. For the other variable, the diameter at 2008, we can see that this is positive. And so this would indicate that uh, there's a positive relationship between diameter and whether or not a tree got outside of browse height. And so this is good. Uh, this means that larger trees have a better ability to get outside of browse uh, over this time period. And you can see, I'll look at the p-values, it makes sense that, and, and it, it makes me feel good as a modeler to know that both of these variables are important to predicting whether or not a tree gets outside browse height. That is the diameter at 2008 and the, the treatment for the no fencing. These p-values are quite small. They're less than say 0 0.05, which indicates they might be good in my prediction. As a way to represent that, here's a useful plot showing the logistic regression results. It combines my two independent variables, my diameter measured at the first time in 2008, and then the treatment, whether or not it's fenced or it's not fenced. And so the first thing you'll notice is that if it's fenced, it has a much higher probability of getting outside of browse in 2013. Say for a 10 millimeter tree, it has about almost an 80% chance of getting outside browse, where it's about 50% for, uh, for the same size tree if it was not fenced. And so it's in, interesting to see these results. And it gives the case that uh, we need to be managing for potentially larger trees, because that's a good indication that they'll get outside of browse, and also to think about something like fencing. Fencing can uh, obviously limit deer browse, in areas. And so this was just a case study looking at how we might use logistic regression in uh, an application in the natural resources.